Well, thank you for singing loudly to our great God. He indeed is awesome, and uh, what a privilege to get to proclaim such timeless, endless, wonderful realities that we'll sing and rejoice in for all eternity. It, it is indeed a privilege. Please open your Bibles to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4. We've been making our way through this book. What we have been finding is that this book is much less about Jonah than we may have first thought. This book is much less about Jonah, and it, it is much more about God. See, the book of Jonah is about God's faithfulness and about God having a heart for the nations and God being willing to do whatever it takes, even using rebellious prophets to bring about his sovereign will. We've seen God raise up people from Tempe and Chandler to take his gospel message to the ends of the earth. And we've seen God raise up people from South Africa to take his gospel message to the ends of the earth. In Jonah, we see a picture of God using even a rebellious prophet to take his message to pagans. Nothing can stop God's sovereign plan. Nothing can stop his will. God's compassion is being put on display in so many levels in the book of Jonah that we get to behold, that we get to see in God's word. We see his compassion to use a sinful man in his sovereign plan. We see his compassion on pagan sailors, right, in chapter 1. We see his compassion on a rebellious prophet. We see a, a whole debased city come to repentance. We are seeing really a, a multifaceted view of God's compassion in the book of Jonah. Now, if you're just joining us in our study this morning, it's important that you understand that up to this point, Jonah has been on quite a ride. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah at the very beginning of this book. He seeks to flee not only from the instruction of the Lord, but from the very presence of the Lord. And so God brings a great wind, a storm on the sea, as Jonah has purchased a ride on a ship through a series of events. It's determined that Jonah is the cause of their distress on this ship, and so Jonah is thrown overboard at his very own request. Jonah believes it's the end for him, and the Lord appoints a fish to swallow Jonah as the means of rescue for Jonah. And through all of this, God is disciplining Jonah and bringing him to a point of obedience. And so Jonah finally goes to Nineveh. That's what we saw last week. And Jonah proclaims God's message, and there is dramatic, extreme conversion in Nineveh. Jonah proclaims God's message there, and the whole city repents and turns from their wicked ways. And this is where we find ourselves this morning. We are going to see Jonah's response to this mass conversion of the Assyrians in Nineveh. So let's look at God's word together. Let's read chapter 4 together, starting in verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord or to Yahweh and said, Please, Yahweh, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Verse 3, therefore now, O Yahweh, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So Yahweh God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. 
When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even unto death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the book of Jonah. We thank you for what the book of Jonah reveals about you, and we thank you for what you have used the book of Jonah to reveal in us. Lord, we pray that as we look at this final chapter this morning, we pray that we would have humble hearts, that we would be contrite, that we would tremble at your word. Lord, that we would see what we must about us, but most importantly, we would see what we must about you and your nature, your character, your compassion, your commitment. And so, Lord, please work in our hearts Conform us more to your son. We pray in his name. Amen. The universe is what we usually think of as the totality of known or supposed objects and phenomena throughout space. And the observable part alone contains over 10 billion trillion stars arranged in about 100 billion galaxies. And it is estimated to be around 156 billion light years in diameter. And and it should just astonish us. We should be undone. We should be speechless. We should drop to our faces in worship that out of all of the planets, out of all of the stars, God has chosen to set his affections on this small solar system and this small planet on us small creatures who by nature are sinners and are at enmity with him. And he didn't create all of those things and then fix his attention on us. He created all of those things to put his glory on display for us that we might see him and his greatness. They scream the glory of his name and his wonder and we should be undone by his greatness. And it should stun us, it should stagger us that God would set his love and set his affections on us in light of how truly awesome and great he is. And while we should be impressed by God's love and God's mercy and God's power and God's holiness and God's grace and God's compassion, Jonah is not impressed. Yet in Jonah's disappointment, God puts some things on display about himself. See, what we see in Jonah 4 is that Jonah's extreme displeasure in God highlights God's amazing nature. Jonah's extreme displeasure highlights God's amazing nature. God has been doing wonderful, amazing, powerful, supernatural things all throughout this book, all in Jonah's life up to this point. And yet the culmination of those things, what God's end was in those things, Jonah is not impressed by. Jonah thinks he knows better. And in his displeasure, he actually accentuates things about God that we must see. He puts on display or highlights things about God that we must understand. And so this morning, we're going to look at three scenes where Jonah is displeased with God, and in his displeasure, we see God's nature shine forth. So number one, what do we see about God's nature? Well, we see that God's character is unchanging. 
God's character is unchanging. There's lots of things we could say about God's character and the greatness of God's character that's revealed in this passage, but one of the things that comes forth to the forefront is that Jonah knew God's character and he knew what God is like and he knew what God would do because it's so ingrained in who God is. It's so a part of him. Look again at verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. The it here is that the people of Nineveh repented. And this greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry over this. And we need to understand this word displeased. We get displeased very easily. I get displeased very easily. It, it displeased me that I overcooked dinner. It displeased me that I missed my appointment and had to reschedule. It, it displeased me that I paid for something and then received poor customer service. Well, this here is more than just a displeasure in the temporal or a, a dissatisfaction or a mild disappointment with our circumstances. This is not just a passing displeasure, but a very revealing displeasure of one's heart. It reveals one's heart in this. This word here for displeased literally means to be evil. Not fit for use or damaged. And what Jonah is actually saying is that it was evil in the sight of him. It was evil in Jonah's sight. In the sight of Jonah, this is evil that Nineveh would be saved and brought to repentance. It was not right. It was not fitting to Jonah's standard. It was a damaged plan for God to save Nineveh. Jonah looks at the work of God and assesses it as evil, as damaged, as a bad plan. And Jonah's response here is going to highlight something about God's character. But before we even get there, we have to pause and ask ourselves, what ways does this thinking come out in us? What ways does this thinking come out in us? It seems foolish of Jonah on this side of things to be angry at God for saving a city. Yet what things in our lives do we find ourselves angry at God for, yet we justify it in our hearts just like Jonah does? What things in our lives do we look at and we find ourselves greatly displeased? That was the wrong way to do things, God. Maybe we're not so far off from Jonah as we think at first glance. Do you have good reason to be angry for not getting that job? Yes, I do. Do you have good reason Reason to be angry at God for the trials in your life? Y- yes, I, I know better. Struggles in your marriage, in your relationships, in your finances? Do you have good reason to be angry over God's perfect plan in your life? Yes, yes I do. He should have. Silence. It's what we hear from Jonah is silence. Jonah is complaining here about God being compassionate towards such evil ones, but in a sense, the very thing he is complaining about in regards to God's character is actually good news for Jonah. Because in verse 1, he attributed evil towards the Lord, which is completely backwards and sinful. But in verse 2, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. And one who relents concerning calamity. And Jonah desperately needs in this moment God to be all of those things with him. Jonah did not want God to do for others what God had already done for Israel and what God had done for Jonah himself. They had tasted God's grace, but he doesn't want anyone else to have it. Instead of wanting the Ninevites to experience the same grace he had received, he wants them to taste destruction without any chance to repent. He wanted grace for himself, but judgment for others. And Jonah prays to God and voices his displeasure. Verse 
Jonah's giving an I told you so response to God. And this isn't a parent to a child. This is a child shaking his fist at a parent. Even more so, it's a a servant, a slave shaking their fist at a master. And that still falls short of what is going on. Jonah prays to God and voices his displeasure. This is a ridiculous scene for Jonah as Jonah responds to God and really reveals what's going on in his heart. All the way back to chapter one of Jonah, we see, I know you, God, I know what you're like. From the moment Jonah flees from the presence of the Lord, Jonah is seriously fixed upon himself and his own wisdom in this. And then look at verse two. Notice how self-centered his prayer is. Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, and so forth. Jonah's saying, this is why I fled, because I know you, and I know what you're like. I know your character. It's unchanging. It's part of who you are. I knew what you would do. You relent concerning calamity. You are slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. And Jonah, in his displeasure, is so self-centered here, even in his prayer to God. I, I, I. He's so distraught by God. He looks back at this and says, I knew better from the beginning. He's justifying his disobedience and his justification is, I knew you would save them and they shouldn't be saved. That's his defense. That's what's going on in his heart. They don't deserve it. But what Jonah is forgetting here, what is not thinking rightly about is the reality that no one deserves to be saved. That's the wonder of God's saving grace. That's the amazing thing about the compassion of God is that he extends mercy and grace and love and kindness towards those who don't deserve it, towards his enemies. Jonah has an expectation, an agenda, and God has thwarted Jonah's plan. God has stepped into Jonah's life and disrupted his priorities, his desires his life. God, how dare you, is what Jonah essentially is saying. Jonah thought he could stop God's redemptive plan for the Ninevites. And this is very sad thinking on the part of Jonah. Instead of wanting the Ninevites to experience the same grace he had received, he wanted them to taste destruction without any chance to repent. Jonah was playing God. He wanted grace for himself. He wanted judgment for others. What does Jesus say about our disposition towards what we want for others? Love your neighbor as yourself. Jonah wants what's best for himself, what's worse for others. Yet Christ calls us to love others as ourself to get our eyes off of ourselves and to fix them on others. And a significant trait of biblical Christianity is that we actually want what's best for others. Every decision in our life isn't run through the filter of what's best for me. In fact, we set aside our own desires. We consider others' needs above our own. What would we want for ourselves? We should want that even for our enemies. Listen, our disgust of a particular sin or our disgust over sins should not overshadow our desire to see God's grace manifested in the hearts of sinners. You should be disgusted and put off by all sorts of terrible sins, mainly your own. But all sorts of terrible sins should put us off. We should be disgusted by those, grieved by those. But that should not overshadow our desire to see God's grace manifested in the hearts of sinners. Sinners. 
We should be put off by terrible sins, gross sins, despicable sins, awful sins, revolting sins. All sin is that. That's what sin is, right? All of it. But we should not let our revulsion over sin trump our desire for God's grace to enter that sinner's life. The greatest thing we could and should desire for those who have sinned against us or those we love most, whether someone has significantly and dramatically and painfully sinned against you or sinned against those whom you love, we should desire most for God's grace to invade those people's lives. That God would save them that God would show kindness to them, that God would show compassion and have mercy on them, that he would relent concerning the calamity that they deserve. Because you know what? We need God to be all of those things for us. Jonah is displeased and angry at God, and it's important we see this because his displeasure is in something about God. He knows God's character and his displeasure over what God does highlights the reality that God's perfect holy character is unchanging, dependable. We, we can look to God and know his character and we can have confidence in whatever is coming our way that this is who God is. This is what God is like. But what is God like? What are these attributes that come out? Well, God is gracious. This is the attitude the Lord has toward the undeserving. This is the reflex of the divine heart, and it is one of grace towards the sinner, of giving to individuals that which they do not deserve. He's compassionate. This is loving mercy. God loves to bestow mercy and to be compassionate. This is the word that is used elsewhere to show a mother's care towards a helpless newborn. She is compassionate towards her child. The child is helpless, undeserving, unable to contribute, and so compassion is shown in that relationship. God is slow to anger. It doesn't say the Lord is without anger. The Bible doesn't teach us that. In fact, we saw in the last chapter that the Lord has an unrelenting anger that unless it is not assuaged in his wrath, it will be brought forth. Yet he is long-suffering. God loves to bring sinners from suffering to hope. He loves to give them life and life abundantly. He loves to give joy where there is no peace, where there is only anger and bitterness and wrath and clamor. He is slow to anger. Jonah also says he is abundant in loving kindness. This is the covenant love of God. It is not merely tied to words, but in actions that he has taken upon us. And so his covenant love is ratified, sealed by real action. And we see this most significantly in the action of sending his very own son to live a holy, blameless life, to go to a cross, to take on himself the wrath of God for all who would repent and believe, and then to conquer death and rise from the grave so that we might be reconciled to God. God is abundant in loving kindness. And he's one who relents concerning calamity. He's forgiving. He holds back what we deserve. He's patient. Really, this is the action that is the manifestation of all those other attributes. And now these attributes of God are, are true. But Jonah is not bringing up these attributes about God as a means of praise of God. He's not thanking or celebrating God's goodness in these things. Rather, what we have here is, is very disturbing. Jonah did, Jonah did not use these words in praise, but as a tirade against the Lord. And this should not escape our notice, because listen, Jonah in chapter 3 was obedient to God. What did God instruct him to do? To go to Nineveh. Well, it took him a while to walk in obedience. He ran from God, but God brought him back. But ultimately, Jonah got to obedience. Jonah eventually was obedient, and so good for him. That's enough, right? He did what the Lord had said. He fulfilled his task. 
but yet his heart was still hard towards the Lord's instruction. His heart was not in it. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've said this before. Child, obey. But not only obey, obey with a happy heart. Jonah's heart is the furthest thing from happy in this moment. He was obedient, but he was not obedient from the heart. It's not enough to simply do what was asked. We must remember to do it with a heart for God, submission to God. That's the difference between the Pharisee and the disciple. You can check a box that says, I did it. I did everything God asked me and still look at what is going on in my life. Why is this trial in my life? I'm a good employee. I'm a good employer. I'm a good husband. I'm a good dad. Why is this happening to me? We need to not just check the box of obedience to God. We need to check our heart in our obedience to God. Jonah could check the box and say he did what God told him to do. But his heart is far from God in this moment. We see how far his heart is in his response in verse 3. Look at verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Verse 3, we see the depths of Jonah's despair on display. Here we see him plea. We see threats. And we see that his pleas and threats are just a subtle form of manipulation. And the Lord sees through all of them. He sees beyond the words of Jonah and asks a piercing question in verse 4. Do you have good reason to be angry? The Lord doesn't answer a fool according to his folly. He answers him according to the folly he deserves. And Jonah's silent. He has nothing, nothing in defense for his anger. In all of this, God's unchanging character is put on display. He is compassionate. He is slow to anger. He is relenting in calamity. He's gracious. God's unchanging character is put on display in what he did for Nineveh, and it is also put on display in how he is caring for Jonah in this moment of weakness and sin. So Jonah's extreme displeasure highlights God's amazing nature. And number one, that we see that God's character is unchanging. Next, we see that God's commitment is unrelenting. Number one was God's character is unchanging. Number two, God's commitment is unrelenting. God relents concerning calamity, but God will not relent in his care for his own. And this is wonderful news. This is wonderful news for all of us who are his. God will not relent in his care for his own, for his prophet. He brought a storm. He appointed a fish. He commanded that fish. Here we see him appoint a plant and a worm and a scorching wind. And God is unrelenting in his pursuit of his prophet. In verse 5, so Jonah moves out of the city and he sat east of it. He doesn't even want to be close to what's going on in Nineveh, but he wants to see what's going to happen there. He moves out of Nineveh. Jonah's trying to do things his own way and he makes some sort of shelter to cover himself from the sun. And God is doing a work of redemption and Jonah wants to get away from it. And then in verse 6, so the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. Jonah's getting away from what God is doing, but he can't get away from God. And God brings, or it says, he appointed a plant to be shade and God is all powerful and is sovereignly at work. And God brings the plant to show grace. And at the end of verse 6, Jonah is happy. Finally. Finally, Jonah is happy. Jonah is satisfied. First time in the book, Jonah is happy. He's upset about Nineveh's salvation, and yet he's happy about a plant. A plant. 
We would never do this right. Be angry at God about something that is actually good and be satisfied and happy about something insignificant and trivial. For some people, that's all that matters is that you are happy. Follow your heart, fulfill your desires, live the American dream. Doesn't matter if you're in sin or not, just be happy. Well, for Jonah, he is happy and not just happy. He is extremely happy. He is deliriously happy. And yes, it should be a stark contrast. In verse one, he's attributing evil to the Lord for saving a people. And now he's happy about a plant. Jonah's a mirror for us. And in view of this, do we really think our emotions and our hearts are trustworthy gauges of what is truly right and good and valuable? And you know what? Jonah's going to be exposed as this trivial thing is taken away from him. And my attachment to trivial things is put on full display when it is taken away from me. Jonah's heart is going to be revealed when his idol is taken away. He's not happy in God as the provider of this shade. He's happy about a plant. So look at verse 7 and 8. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. The Lord here appoints a worm. This is the most determined worm in the history of mankind. The Lord appointed this worm, and this worm is full of divine vigor as it attacks this plant. And this plant is the only thing that's destroyed in the entire story of Jonah. For all the talk of destruction, a boat nearly breaking apart, judgment coming on a whole city, the only thing that is actually destroyed is this vine. Jonah was rejoicing in this plant like Golem in his ring, and God takes it away. And not only is the plant destroyed, but God appoints a scorching east wind. Third time, the word appointed appears in our passage. Now, this wind, this scorching east wind, is a common occurrence in the Middle East. And let me just read to you a description of what it is like, what happens. When this happens, temps rise dramatically, the humidity drops quickly, and it becomes a constant and extremely hot wind. And in that portion of the world, it contains fine particles of dust, and researchers have found that the constant hot air is so full of positive ions that it affects the level of serotonin and other brain neurotransmitters, causing extreme exhaustion, feelings of unreality, and occasionally bizarre behavior. These are similar to the Santa Ana winds in California, which might explain some things. Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even unto death. Jonah has been trying to go his own way and now he is at the point of extreme frustration with life. And he has a sinful grasp of reality and a sinful grasp of God. And this has led him to say that death is better than life. This reasoning, this is reasoning that is not coming from the mind of God. It is reasoning that is only coming from his own straying reasoning. It is a sinful grasp of reality. So God answers him, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? Jonah's response, even unto death. You can hear the bitterness in his response. Jonah says, yes, I have reasons. You bet I have reasons. 
there are none. And God is actually here in this illustration and what he's doing in Jonah's life with this plant and this worm and this wind. He's holding up a mirror to help Jonah see how foolish he is in his thinking. Jonah had been a great recipient of God's grace and now he wants to live without it. Yet God's commitment to teach Jonah his foolishness is unrelenting. He is gracious when we don't deserve it. He doesn't ask for permission to invade our lives. He does it. It is his sovereign will to do this, his unrelenting commitment to use events and people and fish and worms and winds and plants so that we, like Jonah, will be directed from our own way and brought into alignment with his way. This is the kindness of God that he would be so long-suffering so patient, so gracious. And he is that way with every one of his children. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, you can have confidence in God. His care for you is unrelenting. He will not remove his grace from your life. He will not leave you to yourself as we've seen several times. The Lord disciplines those he loves. He is faithful. God causes all things to work for your good if you are a follower of Jesus. And we don't always know why, and we don't always know how, and we don't know always what he is doing, but we can trust that even when it doesn't make sense to us, even when we have no explanation, God's character is unchanging, and his commitment to his own is unrelenting. He is good and far more important than controlling our circumstances around us to get our own desired outcome is that we are pleasing to the Lord in our circumstances. That's what he wants. We can trust him with tomorrow. We need to be pleasing to him today. Lastly, number three, what do we see about the nature of God We see God's compassion is unbiased. God's compassion is unbiased. He's a compassionate God and he does not discriminate in his compassion. His compassion is unbiased. Look at verse 10. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. You see, God is serious about his compassion and he is teaching Jonah a lesson about his compassion here. The Lord puts all of this into perspective for Jonah and for us as well. Jonah was so happy, deliriously happy about this plant that he had nothing to do with. That grew up one night and it was gone the next day. Jonah cared about the plant but was angry about the salvation of Nineveh. God has continually shown grace to Jonah, but Jonah wants to put limits on the compassion God shows to others. And in verse 11, we see the main point of the whole book. Verse 11, this is God saying, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. See, verse 11 is the key to understanding this whole book. God's love is not limited to one particular people or person. His love is unrelenting. His grace is immeasurable. His mercy is amazing. And yet it is not limited to one people group. God is a God who loves to save. God is a God who loves the nations and will save those whom he desires to save. He's not biased in his compassion. Jonah was upset about a plant and yet angry that God showed compassion to Nineveh where there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand. This is most likely referring to children ages six and under which puts the population of the whole city most likely around 600,000 people. 
as well as many animals. Jonah's upset about a plant being destroyed, but he wants a city with 120,000 children under six, six and under and animals to be destroyed. And some find this ending to the book dissatisfying as there's not a clear resolution on where Jonah ends. And if this book was primarily about Jonah, that would be a problem. Some people find it dissatisfying that there's not a conclusion to what actually happens with Jonah. But this book was never primarily about Jonah. It has always been about God and what needs to grip us and captivate our hearts and captivate our minds and captivate our affections is that God is a compassionate God who shows mercy to whom he chooses, has a sovereign plan that he is orchestrating perfectly in his grace and compassion, brings us into that plan, forgives us our sins, relents desert concerning the calamity that we deserve and saves us. And it's not limited to one nation, one people group, one demographic. The Lord is wise. He's omniscient. He is holy. And he is bringing all things to pass for his great glory and his perfect purposes. And so this book ends with God presenting a contrast between two paths. There's Jonah's view and God's view. Jonah's way was different from God, and he's upset because God didn't do it the right way. And God says, all my ways are right. And my love reaches far beyond one people group, Israel. And Jonah's sinful response to God's ways here is not here so that we can say, God, thank you that I'm not like Jonah. I would never be like Jonah. As I said before, Jonah here is a mirror held up before us. The book of Jonah was a mirror for Israel as Jonah was a representative of his people. But you know what? He, he's a mirror for us. Are, are you trusting God's character? Are you submitting your life wholly to him and his instruction from his word? Are, are you trusting that his sovereign will is what is best? And you know, this is easy when God raises up a plant. But it's hard when it's something that doesn't make sense to us. Saving Nineveh didn't make sense to Jonah. Jonah made an idol out of his comfort. He valued a withering plant more than the withering souls of Nineveh. Here we see that God is not a cosmic puppet to act out all of our desires of what we think is best. He is divine and supremely powerful and has a predetermined plan that he is executing perfectly for his glory and his children's good. And never once has God's plan been delayed, deterred, adjusted. Nothing has ever caught God off guard. He is supremely powerful and supremely sovereign and he is only holy all the time. One day we will see him, we will be made like him, we will be holy, but God is a notch above the rest of us. Only God is holy, holy, holy. And he's worthy of our praise and he's worthy of our worship and our submission, even when we don't understand. Even when we can't see beyond the confusion of the moment. Even when we can't see beyond the disappointment of the moment. Even when we feel like the cost is too much and we cannot bear it, we must obey, we must submit, we must trust, we must bend our will to his because his will is perfect. He is a God who loves to save. He is a God who is committed to his own. He is a God of compassion who cares with a deep love for those who are his and those whom he will save. Do you know this God? This, this is a God like no other. 
He is so good, and he has displayed his goodness most clearly in his son, whom he sent as a substitute to take our place, to bear our burden, to absorb our wrath, so that though we run from him, suppress the truth about him, we might be reconciled to him. If you don't know this, God, you must. You must. Don't wait another moment. God is slow to anger, but his wrath is coming. He withholds calamity, but there's a time when it will be withheld no more. And our only hope is that we know salvation through his son, Jesus. Thank God for his compassion. Thank God for his love and grace that he shows to those who don't deserve it. Let's pray. God, we... We need help. It is easy to get distracted, to think we know what's best, to not set our hearts and our minds on what is true, to question your works, to not submit. Lord, thank you for your commitment to your mission to save sinners. Thank you for your commitment to those whom you have saved. We would all do well to fix our hearts all the more on our great God, to behold his splendor, to see his majesty, to know his character. So Lord, help us. Help us to live in joyful, submissive obedience to you and help us to be obedient, active participants in your gospel message, your unbiased desire to save sinners. And help us to preach with courage your great message in the gospel. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.